Okay, as we're continuing to have a few people join from the waiting room, I'm just going to get started um, just noting how excited I am to, to be here with you all and the, the great interest that people have shown in our Dissemination and Implementation Science Graduate Certificate Program here at the University of Colorado. In terms of uh, our directors and our sponsors, just want to tell you a little bit about that. Um, I'm the director of the program and Borska Rabin is my counterpart or co-director of the certificate program. No way I could do this without her. She's an outstanding co-director. And we've also, we're situated with a primary sponsor, again, speaking of things we couldn't do the program without, of the Accords program here at the University of Colorado. That's a, um, the Adult and Child Consortium for Health Outcomes Research and Delivery Science, which is our primary sponsor. And in terms of the graduate school structure, the Clinical Sciences Graduate School is part of our NIH funded CC, CTSA, the Colorado Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute. And we are housed underneath that graduate program. Uh, courses in our certificate can also apply for a master's degree or a doctoral uh, degree in that program. And Dr. Secuto and Galit Mankin are our excellent partners in that program. In terms of our faculty, we have a diverse faculty from um, uh, academic institutions across the country. Um, we, we list just some of our affiliations here on this slide and I would point you to our website that we had on the previous two slides and we'll also be showing at the end during our question and answer to see more about our faculty, learn more about their backgrounds. Uh, but briefly, we are just showing some of their specific affiliations here. And I will mention that in addition to our University of Colorado um, Academic Medical Center, we include faculty from the University of California, San Diego, from Washington University in St. Louis, and from the Loyola School of Public Health. For today's presentation, we're trying to orient it uh, according to the what, why, who, where, when, and how, as you can see on this slide. Um, and my co-director Borska is going to go through the what uh, pieces of the program, and then I'm going to address the, the remainder of, of the bullet points on this slide. Passing the baton over to Borska now. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Borska Rabin. Very excited to have you in this presentation and um, we'll answer your questions later on. But I will start by just providing very brief um, background on dissemination and implementation research. I expect most of you are familiar with the field. The concept of dissemination research and implementation research, those are interrelated but different ideas. They have different goals and different types of activities that we undertake. While dissemination research is primarily focusing on studying how to distribute the uh, evidence-based intervention or information to a target population within the context of public health or clinical practice, or you know, asking the question how best to package, communicate about, and deliver evidence-based interventions. Implementation research is more focused on the receiving end, studying how to use strategies to help the uptake, integration, and sustained use of an evidence-based intervention, and figuring out ways to support that on that um, implementation side. Next slide. Again, uh, many of you will be familiar with the uh, first two numbers on this slide. There is an estimation that in using traditional dissemination and implementation approaches that are not very active, it takes about 17 years to get only 14% of research evidence into practice. Indeed, a very long time and a small portion of evidence reaching the end beneficiaries. There is some hope though, there are some studies that now are looking at how we can improve these numbers. And there is one particular study that was able to show that with active dissemination and implementation approaches, so proactive ways of moving forward, we can achieve an up to 80% um, integration of research evidence and decrease the 17 years to as low as three years. So this is one study, it's on the bottom of the slide there. Um, we have discussed a lot of these numbers, but this is just to show you that there is some hope to improve our processes if we think about DNI. Next slide. And then when we think about dissemination and implementation science, 
and the um, translational continuum going from bench to bedside to more population health translation, most of the DNI activities are happening in this T3, T4 context, moving practice uh, to public health or patients to practice. However, we like to argue that DNI does have relevance in earlier T stages, especially when we think about designing for dissemination, implementation, and sustainment. And so as you are thinking about your own work, even if you are working in the earlier T stage, you can benefit from some of these strategies and principles. Next slide, please. So what was the rationale for uh, creating the dissemination and implementation graduate certificate at uh, CU? First of all, we were hoping to address a gap that exists for um, both locally and nationally for rigorous training in DNI science, both in the health services and the public health research arena. We are very fortunate to have an outstanding faculty with DNI expertise and resources on campus, but we are also connected nationally with other DNI leaders and we were able to invite them into our program, both as, as co-instructors and often as guest lecturers in our courses. Next slide. Our educational philosophy is to create tailored materials and assignments to assign these based on the current DNI experience level, professional background, and future goals of each student. To be able to um, do that, um, we are using a small class size approach. Our classes are maximum of 10, 15 uh, students. We are also using a combination of synchronous and asynchronous learning, and we will tell you a little bit more about this. And we are definitely uh, focused on balancing theoretical, more didactic teaching with practical applied learning, allowing the students to apply what we taught to them right during the class to their own research goals in clinical and public health settings. Next slide. We are a competency-based program. We identify the long set of competencies and align them with each Plus, and they are measuring these competencies and whether the students are able to attain them. This is just a subset of the types of competencies that we have integrated into our program. Many of you are familiar where they come from. Um, there is um, wonderful work and references there, but just highlighting a couple of them. We are focusing on developing um, skills in identifying why and how to use DNI models. Also thinking about designing pragmatic interventions and evaluations for those thinking about appropriate process and outcome measures, the balance between adaptation and fidelity, we have highlighted that very much in our program, thinking of mixed methods and then engagement of key stakeholders. Next slide, please. The program is set up to um, uh, be a 12 credit hour uh, certificate with, uh, within three year period. We are achieving this through a set of required and elective courses. And as I mentioned earlier, these courses are all online and a combination of synchronous and asynchronous uh, learning approaches. The synchronous approach is supported uh, with Zoom and the asynchronous is with the Canvas platform, which allows for additional independent learning tasks to be assigned and discussion boards to continue interaction between the students, building on peer uh, learning as well. The first slide here shows the required courses, which add up to seven credit hours. And as you can see, three of them are the Introduction to Dissemination and Implementation Research in Health, Designs and Mixed Methods in Implementation Research, and Designing for Dissemination and Sustainability. And we will provide more detail on each course in a moment. Next slide, please. And then the elective courses uh, add up to five credit hours. It can be achieved either by taking uh, one of the three courses listed here, understanding DNI context and adaptation, grant writing for DNI research, and advanced topics in DNI science. Or you can choose from a set of electives that we identified and get permission from our certificate director to um, take credits up to three using those courses. Next slide, please. So now we are going to give you a brief overview of the different courses that we uh, offer to you. The first one I'm going to talk a little bit about, and then I will hand this over to Amy. 
This is the Introduction to Dissemination and Implementation Research in Health, which I am very uh, lucky to co-teach with Dr. Stutz, who is also on the line and will be able to answer questions at the end. We are focused on key DNI models, methods, and measures. We are supporting students in the development of DNI grants or a quality improvement project over the semester with very detailed tailored feedback on the proposal pieces and opportunity to interact with uh, peers about uh, feedback and present on their work. We um, think that um, the exciting piece of this is that once you have developed this basic form of the proposal, you will be able to carry this to future courses and further develop those to uh, hopefully end with a submission to a grant um, funding agency. Thank you, Borska, for that excellent introduction on what the program is and on your course, which uh, we'll see in a minute, uh, the, the great reviews that your course receives. Um, so the, uh, the course by Drs. Holtrup and Dorsey Holloman, this is also a highly uh, reviewed course. Um, it, it goes into both an in-depth examination of dissemination implementation science study designs, builds on that introduction that Borsk and Tina uh, do in their course, and then addresses um, for evaluation uh, the importance of mixed methods approaches as well as the specific benefits from the qualitative and the quali quantitative data collected. As Borska just mentioned, this um, uh, adds on um, to a distinct way to the research proposal um, skeleton that was developed in Borska's course by um, working on a DNI methods section for the approach for a research proposal. The next course I'll talk about is the Designing for Dissemination course taught by Drs. Murado and Kwan. And this is Designing for Dissemination and Sustainability. Um, and the ideas here is how much uh, you need to really engage with the key stakeholders who will be part of the success of the program that you're developing. Uh, it addresses elements of design thinking, um, thinking through the context for different stakeholders, conducting key informant interviews with stakeholders, um, talking to people and finding out what their pains and gains, what the value is for the program you're developing from them. And, and it culminates in a final oral presentation and report and informs things like a dissemination plan and also the stakeholder engagement portion of, of a research proposal. Uh, for, for Dr. Stutz and Rabin, uh, their newest course that we're just launching this semester is Understanding DNI Context and Adaptation. As Borska mentioned early on, we're very excited about um, the, this evolving area of DNI science and how we best adapt uh, programs, evidence-based programs to situational context, really tailor them to what each site and setting needs. And, some pieces that they'll address as noted on the, the slide are learning to assess, guide, and balance the adaptations with the need for fidelity to the core components. Um, we're, we're very interested in the ideas of the notions of form and function that Brian Mittman and colleagues have been putting forth in this regard. Uh, also developing understanding and skills for assessing uh, the context. How do you actually do this when you're doing the research? So it's great to think about it in theory, but how do you apply it? And also uh, real, uh, real sense of equity and how we make sure that we're adapting um, equitably um, so that different populations that have differential uh, capacity initially to do a program could still take it forward. Um, the grant writing for DNI course that Drs. Glasgow and Bronson lead um, is it's a uh, really letting again students take what the program is that they're looking to bring forward, whether it's a, an NIH proposal, whether it's an R-level proposal, a career development award proposal, um, a local internal grant, a quality improvement program, um, whichever that is, it's uh, providing the, the ability to write a compelling proposal for reviewers, thinking through the different segments of a grant and what, um, what's different about a dissemination implementation grant than others. The students are drafting and revising these sections over the course of uh, the, the semester. And there's a mock study section as the final exam. So as to get experience reviewing others grants as well as getting feedback on your own. My course, the Advanced Research Topics in DNI Science is uh, really a bridge to the, the backbone of our DNI research team meeting here at the University of Colorado. So we have journal club discussions, we have works in progress and students join alongside our full DNI team as part of this for the course. We add in specific journal club presentation for the students as well as a research presentation and have them again participating in discussion threads and reflecting on how to use these um, 
just in time, you know, areas of evolving DNI science to enrich the innovation of their work. We have just a couple of testimonials on this slide and we have some others on our website in terms of what students um, think of our program. You'll note that we do have students uh, from outside of the University of Colorado as well as students in the University of Colorado in our program. We really seek to have a balance there of students from inside and outside the institution here. In terms of the target audience, who should pursue this certificate? As Borska went through at the beginning, uh, sort of the, the basic premise is that, are you interested in doing this uh, T3, T4 translational research and to implement evidence-based programs or also to design uh, programs that are um, taking stock of what stakeholders need if really there's not evidence-based programs yet for the sort of key research question or problem that you need to address? and professionals in health, uh, whether it's health services, community health, public health research. Beyond that, um, these are not you know, an exhaustive list, but we've recognized from those who've applied to date and those who've entered our program that there's a few different career stages that seem to uh, sum up the types of students who apply, either those who are uh, about to embark on a K award or who are doing a K award. And this is part of the training that they're proposing in implementation science for that period of, um, the, the K award. Those who are mid-career faculty and have already been doing some research in this area, but really want to take their um, expertise to the next level to be able to consult with others on the DNI methods needs for their grants, as well as um, infusing their grants with, with this, uh, these methods. Those who are in a uh, doctoral program, PhD or Dr. PH, and as this can be a potential area of minor concentration. And then also those uh, exploring areas for a PhD. In addition, uh, those who are doing program evaluation um, in your institution who are um, doing more of a QI process, uh, that's also been a key group. Those who are leading implementation uh, forward and champions for implementation have also been another group. In terms of uh, where the hell, uh, even before COVID, so this is one area where we were perhaps primed for the disruption of COVID, we already had um, developed this program to be on fully available online um, through the Zoom platform. And our students are participating from across the United States presently. Our academic home, as I mentioned in the earlier slides, is through our uh, local NIH CTSA, the Colorado Clinical and Sciences Institute in that graduate program and the courses can be applied to those degrees. how to apply. Um, we've listed the admission requirements here on the slide and uh, admission is competitive. So we do hold a review of applicants and um, you know, the, the questions, the answers to the brief questions about your interest in DNI training are things we're looking to hear. You know, why is this important to you? How will this advance your career? How does this fit with your interests? So we wanna uh, really hear you speak your voice there in those questions for our application. In terms of what application form to uh, use, so we, we are a, a state institution of higher learning. So as you might expect, there can be some red tape. Um, we have two separate forms because if, you, if students are already part of a University of Colorado um, training program, whether they're a current PhD student or enrolled in postgraduate studies, then there's a specific form for those individuals in Formstack. If you're outside of the University of Colorado, you definitely complete the slate form and we have a website center with FAQs on this application process and the table I'm going to show you on the next slide to try to make this more clear. So you can see on this left hand column, ooh, excuse me, the left hand column um, with slate application, this is for um, everyone who's not at University of Colorado and those who are at the University of Colorado, it describes if you're a medical student or a graduate student at Boulder or Colorado Springs, those folks would still um, do this slate form, even though they are students at the University of Colorado. And everybody else um, at the University of Colorado who's already a student would use Formstack. Then, uh, and I, I should highlight at the top, if you're at the University of Colorado and you're not a graduate student, you're not currently in any graduate coursework, you also fill out this slate form. Then we have the link to applications on both of these that you can click on. And these are again on our website in the admissions section of the site. Um, and Galit with uh, the clinical sciences program 
is our point of contact for any challenges with the logistics of the application, whereas I answer, you'd email me for big picture questions. Um, cost information listed here. We don't have any new updates for the 2021-2022 um, academic year, but we will post those on our website. Um, if they change, they were fairly stable from uh, the last academic year to this one. As a reminder, it's 12 credit hours total to complete the certificate. We've had students complete the certificate in as little as um, one and a third years, uh, one and a half years, or uh, some are also planning to do it over the longer three-year time frame. For the, the this admission cycle, those who would be applying here now uh, through the the our application is available now. The deadline is March first to complete it and submit it to us. Then we'll be making decisions um, at the end of March, early April, sending out um, letters to individuals to so that they know if they're going to be starting courses in the summer semester or the fall semester. We will work with you for your preference to start in the summer semester or the fall semester. And there's some sample course plans on our website that show the order of courses you would take depending on which of those uh, approaches works best for you. In terms of uh, acknowledgements, we have many people to acknowledge. Um, most, uh, I definitely want to acknowledge my co-presenter today, Borshka Rabin, uh, my co-director, uh, and then Elise Robertson, who's been our silent person behind the scenes, making this all happen, getting you all the website information for today, the Zoom information. So um, thank you so much, Elise. Also really want to call out in terms of our primary sponsor, the support from uh, Dr. Allison Kemp and JD Ainsworth for the program, and Katie Klossner, who's really helped us with the marketing to get the word out to everyone, as well as our secondary sponsors and others listed on this slide. As I briefly mentioned a, a minute ago, for general program questions, you can contact me. For application specific questions, you can contact Galit. And we will be posting these slides as well as a recording of this uh, uh, webinar on our website. You can click on this link that we have on the slides to join our mailing list. And now we're at the point to take uh, questions and answers, which we are hoping to do through the chat. Let me see if I can. Great. So uh, I do not, oh, we have a few questions um, that are, have already come through. So um, please do submit more questions in the chat. And I'm looking here at the questions Elise has helped us to compile. Um, so I'll take the first question here and Borska, you can help me decide on any prioritization to these as well. Is it possible to complete the program with one, within one year? So it would be an accelerated course of study. Um, but uh, as I said, the, the, the shortest period of time anyone has uh, taken to complete it so far is beginning in um, August of 2019 and completing in December of 2020. So uh, I think an ambitious student, we could certainly arrange for the electives to go um, in the right order. It would also depend to what extent you've had previous exposure to uh, dissemination implementation science, or if you would sort of need some of these courses to help build uh, towards each other. But uh, very close to one year has already been done. Let's see, Borska, do you see any on there that are particularly a good one for you to answer? I was just um, addressing more a general question about international students and we have the ability to work with you if you are outside of the United States. Uh, and um, there are some additional requirements for language uh, proficiency from certain parts and um, we can work with you definitely on those questions. So if you have specific um, issues with that, Amy will be a good contact initially, and then we can figure it out. Thanks for picking that one up, Borshika. I'm also seeing, um, so I'll, I'll go in the order that Elise is helping us compile these in, in a certain order. I'll go through the next one in order, and Borshika, maybe you want to pick out the one for after that. So uh, the question that I'm seeing here is, um, I understand that this is a much more detailed program as compared to the TIDIRC training, for example, being T-I-D-I-R-C as opposed to TIDIR. We have a lot of TID um, 
DNI training programs in the world. Um, could you talk a little bit about how this program could add to learning and skills developed from programs like TIDERC? So I think that's a, a great question. I will say that uh, I, I'm wondering if um, others on our call who've been part of TIDERC, I'm looking if Borska, have you been part of that? I know Russ had been in the past, but I think we're still waiting for him to join us. I was a um, guest faculty, but not core faculty for the TIDER program. Uh, let me see if I can provide you with some general um, response here. And when Rush joins, he can say more. Um, the, what we found with uh, students who came into our program after completing TIDER or IRI or other types of national training programs, that they have a relatively good understanding from the uh, introductory perspective. Uh, some of them even took the introductory class still and found new components. We get into much more depth. And um, what they still find very useful is to think about a specific research project and work on it and get feedback. And so that's kind of where uh, those students who have had some initial exposure find that introductory course important. As we get into the more advanced courses, um, we feel that those are actually going beyond what TIDER covers in terms of the design methodology and um, designing for dissemination and implementation and sustainment, um, context and adaptation. So we are able to expand on areas that have been introduced in a more introductory way, and we are able to provide you with more opportunity to practice those, build those into your own research program. And we will come back to this when Russ can join us if he has additional comments there. But Amy, if you don't mind, I will address the next question um, that was about opportunities or courses that focus on topic-specific DNI, such as chronic disease prevention or health promotion. So currently, the program uh, was set up to provide uh, topic-agnostic courses. So everyone who comes in, they can have various types of interest, various types of settings they work in. And so um, they are using the methodology that we are teaching to their specific settings. Some of the courses that we identified on the um, list of electives are more topic specific or get into a more specific methodology. But at this point, our goal is to provide more methodological focus and allow the students to bring the specific interest that they have. During the courses, we do introduce topic-specific examples. For example, cancer prevention and control, mental health, et cetera. But we don't have courses that are focused on one of those sub-areas at this time. Thank you for taking those questions, Borska. And we do definitely encourage people to continue to put questions in the chat. Um, the, Next one I'm seeing that I'll take is um, how many students will you be taking for June 2021? And our plans at this time um, are to accept 11 students for June 2021. We're also looking carefully at our class size issues and um, other factors, but that allows us to keep our small class sizes of 10 to 15 um, scholars per course uh, maximum. So that's our intent. Uh, we still have another DNI certificate faculty meeting uh, coming up in another week or two so that could slightly wiggle but that's the the general approach and just for ballpark last year we had about uh, 20 applications i mean the next question was about fellowship and funding support i would love you to address that yeah that's a, that's that's a great one so in terms of fellowships and funding aid um the, uh, at this time, we don't have a scholarship program in place, um, although it's, your question is making me uh, think about it further, especially um, some of our affiliations with things like uh, implementation science cancer centers around the country who have also asked us things like, could we have a prorated, you know, approach to getting one of our scholars into this program. So I think this is a point that we will definitely take into further consideration. Um, we are a, still a relatively new program where we've got our, you know, just our first graduates under our belt here in the last year. And we're looking to be innovative and, and come up with ways to open up our program to as many people as possible. So thank you for your question. But at this time, we do not have fellowships or funding aid available.
And then there was also a point about information about program costs will help too. So the, the cost slide that I shared, um, you know, was in, the costs are per uh, credit hour, uh, each uh, credit hour for the course as it's, you'll see on our slides when we share them on the website, but around $500 for, uh, per credit hour for those in-state and around $1,000 per credit hour for those out of state. It's a total of 12 credit hours to complete the program. So just multiply 12 by uh, the per credit hour um, cost. Amy, I was wondering because some of the questions were getting to this but did not ask explicitly, should we talk a little bit about the students that we have currently, what kind of backgrounds they have interest, kind of the diversity that we see in the classrooms? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful um, point, Borshka. And, you know, since you had all, pretty much all of our new um, students for the last cohort in your introductory course, maybe we could unmute Tina Stutes also, Elise, and let um, Borska and Tina speak to um, those backgrounds and, you know, maybe some relative strengths that you've seen about different types of backgrounds for um, taking the course. Hi, <laughs> Borska, are you wanting me to start? That would be wonderful, Tina. If you okay, would, okay, let me start. Of, what was your perspective on the, you know, the kind of the diversity of backgrounds and interests and uh, the strength that the students brought to the classroom? So um, in this course last semester, we had 15 students, um, which was on the large side for these classes. That's probably the largest, but it's also a required, it's, it's a prerequisite for some of the other certificate courses. So everyone takes this introductory course. Um, the, the, the range of interest was really broad. So we had um, one student who works with OSHA, who is really interested in occupational safety and health. Um, and she has a leadership position there. So she was you know, fairly advanced in terms of um, DNI expertise already and is using this to kind of um, build more expertise and, and bring DNI to her agency. We had um, doctoral students who were in public health we had um, people who were really interested in clinical decision aids and IT. We had um, mental health. So we had people who were really interested in um, integrating mental health programs into clinical health settings. Oh goodness, Borsica, we had so many different interests. So one of the things that was great about this, the fact that we focus on uh, methodology is that people are coming from very disparate fields. And so everyone has um, sort of applied examples or experiences that they bring to discussion. And um, all of the classes are really heavy on interacting with your um, colleagues in the class and learning from other fields. So as far as instructors, you know, Borsika and I both have our specific areas of interest, you know, our topical areas in health, but both of us are really methodologists. And so it's, uh, from our perspective, it's amazing to kind of hear uh, what people are already doing in these fields, especially fields that we are not as familiar with um, and how they, can, how they can build upon what we teach in the class and what they learn from each other. So I'm thinking specifically, there was um, one student this past semester who was actually very interested in dissemination rather than implementation. And in DNI, there's a, um, you know, if you kind of look at, at the literature, there's a, it's weighted towards implementation. There are definitely people working on dissemination, but in terms of the theories and frameworks and models and measures, um, there's a heavy emphasis on implementation. So she had the opportunity actually to bring a lot of information. She, throughout the semester, was working on an application that was more focused on dissemination of physical activity guidelines for patients with spinal cord injuries, which was an area that I don't think anyone else in the class had um, much background knowledge in, but it really enriched the class. So people in the class were at different levels of familiarity with DNI as well, which is fine because I think that as a class, everyone um, rises together and all learn from each other. Thank you so much, Tina. I don't know that I have much to add, but I noticed that Dr. Glasgow joined us and I was wondering whether um, I could um, ask him to um, be unmuted and ask a question about the TIDER program. Russ, uh, welcome. And uh, the question that was uh, submitted to us was about the difference 
between the TIDER and this graduate certificate, and more specifically, how those who have completed the TIDER might still benefit from a graduate certificate program, uh, knowing that they already have some background knowledge in DNI. Great question, Borsica, and uh, great to be able to join you and uh, see the number of people that are uh, that are on this morning. Um, I think. Uh, tighter might be a little easier to answer. There, there's a corollary question about some of the more mentored two year long programs that are going on now too, um, that I can answer separately, but I don't wanna to take too long. I would say that it's just the comprehensiveness and the intensity of the uh, number of courses you know, you, you get quite a bit more, there's a whole lot more reading, a whole lot more discussion. You know, we anticipate it'll take most people a couple years to get through the certificate program. So uh, it's, it's just much more in depth than particularly what you would get in, in TIDERC and in any of the particular areas that we emphasize, like understanding, uh, evaluation, uh, grant writing, uh, really diving, doing a deep dive into uh, theories and frameworks. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe stop there, but I'd say it was more just the depth. And then also I do think it's a difference when you come out having a credential, a certificate, rather than just saying I've participated, you know, in a, a training program. Um, I'll pause there. I could, if, if you want to take the time, talk about some of the more intensive mentored, like two-year uh, programs, if you'd like. But I'll, otherwise, I'll stop there, unless you or others have a follow-up. Yeah, I think I think that the specific question was to tie DIRC, D-I-R-C. So, um, you know, to what extent, if a person has already completed tie DIRC or one of the more intensive uh, two-year mentored programs, how would this um, fit for them? Would it really provide value from our perspective? Yeah. Well, uh, to be honest, it's been a year or so since I've been involved in Ty Dirk. My understanding is that there's a, a virtual, that there used to be an in-person uh, component to it, but of course there isn't any more for the foreseeable future. Um, I still see that as a lot less comprehensive and a lot less intense. Um, you do have the mentoring, at least you used to. So you, you have a kind of more one-to-one -one or sometimes a two-to-one relationship with a mentor. But I believe that's still over a less than a year period. And it's, uh, it's a lot, lot less didactic. Um, to my knowledge, there are very few readings there's a lot of presentations that, that you would see, and you do get exposure to a variety of national faculty a, a, as you would here uh, in this program. But I, again, I don't think it's anywhere near the kind of ongoing basis or the focus on integrating uh, different courses and uh, that sort of thing. You, you do work on one product, uh, but again, I think you'd have more different uh, products here. And again, just a, a lot more ongoing um, I I interactions and uh, variety of faculty there rather than largely just kind of one mentor. Thank you, Russ. That, I think that did hit the question. And um, anyone else who did have questions about that, and please note in the chat if we didn't do, uh, didn't hit it completely. Uh, I am not seeing any new questions in the chat. I am interested in whether others have things to add. Um, I think, oh, here comes. So I'll answer a, a specific question that just came to me. Uh, well, actually, uh, Bethany, before I, before I go to that, at least could you unmute Bethany? It looks like maybe you did, or at least gave her video privilege. In the spirit of comparing this to other programs around the country, uh, I'm going to ask Bethany to speak to our program as compared to the IS2 program. Yeah, Maybe so orient people to what that is, Bethany. Yeah, so um, the Institute for Implementation Science Scholars, IS2, is a program run out of the um, Washington University in St. Louis, um, and it focuses on people interested in um, mental and behavioral health and health equity types of, of research, chronic disease management, 
Um, and so it's sort of focused on that particular topic area that was doing work in that area. Um, and the way that it works, it's a two year program um, that has mentorship from you know, internationally recognized faculty in dissemination implementation science. Um, and you know, has a series of webinars and learning opportunities that, um, to, to really introduce you. I feel like it's a good introduction to dissemination implementation science. Uh, our certificate program is different from IS2 and, and from my understanding of um, things like TITER and TITER is that this gives you a, a credential, um, a, an actual um, degree of sorts, obviously not a degree, but a, a certificate, but an, an actual um, credential that you can put on your um, CV demonstrating that you have um, achieved certain competencies through um, grades, through completion of course assignments, um, and I don't know about TITER, but IS2 doesn't have that. There's not an, uh, um, an evaluation of having achieved competencies. Uh, and as a result, uh, because you are being evaluated and, and on, your, on what you've accomplished in these courses according to grades, it, I feel like it makes you take things just a little bit more seriously and, and really demonstrating your expertise and building skills um and in a really concrete way and an efficient way too thanks for clarifying bethany and i had a question and we appreciate all big picture and brass tack questions a brass tack question i had in the chat that i'll address was can payment of tuition be done all at the beginning of the certificate or does it have to be done each semester? And at least at this point, our uh, financing model is these are graduate school courses. So you pay your tuition at the beginning of the semester. But this question is well, so I'd say consider for this application cycle, that is the way it will be. But this question as well as the other about any opportunities for um, Scholar, uh, scholarship, tuition support, fellowships, uh, ways to offset costs. Um, these are great questions that encourage us to think about that as we go forward with the program. Are there alternate financing models that we could help to develop? So I appreciate the question very much. We do have some other comments in the chat that um, should be visible to all of you um, from Russ and from Tina also about how the this certificates focus that this ties in a bit with the question Borska answered earlier too about whether it's topic specific DNI um, or it's more all comers and um, Ru Russ is noting that we have a broader base of um, appeal but Borska also noted we really get excited about certain topic areas including equity, cancer prevention, cancer treatment. But as Borska noted, we, we have people who cross all kinds of spectrum of content and we really value that it enriches everyone to think about how to solve implementation problems in different spaces. Amy, if we are still waiting for questions, I thought we could ask Bethany just to say a few more words about her course and then Russ, since Russ is on, just a couple of words about the- I really uh, like that. Uh, grant certificate. And then if we have time, uh, Tina, if you could prepare to say a little bit more about the adaptation and context, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. So our Designing for Dissemination and Sustainability course focuses on building skills uh, around methods for what we call customer discovery, um, stakeholder engagement, um, and developing dissemination plans. Uh, and so this is a, a a course in, in which you're actually going out and talking to your stakeholders, talking to potential adopters, influencers, um, users of whatever innovation it is that you're planning on developing and using um, in your research or testing in your research. And this is really important because you're really thinking at the beginning about what is it that your stakeholders need and want? What are their what we call jobs, pains, and gains? What are the value propositions of your innovation? And so this is a, a highly effective strategy for determining, is this something the world really needs? And when we 
right now what we tend to do is spend a lot of time developing and testing interventions that we think are a good idea. But until we actually go out and find out what's going to fit into the intended setting, re really work for the intended audience, um, we can spend all this time on something that will sit on a shelf and never be used. And so this is a, a really fun course. There's a lot of opportunity to get out and talk to people um, virtually last summer um, and ideally in person, go visit the context, visit the, the setting in which this will be used and implemented and see, you know, put your own eyes on how it will actually work. Um, and yes, so this is, uh, this worked even this past summer um, with people trying to talk um, over phone or Zoom. It, it's not ideal, um, but you can still do it. Thank you so much, Bethany. Russ, would you be willing to be next? Sure, I'd be glad to uh, go ahead and take any questions. Uh, first of all, I think the, uh, the greatest thing about uh, this course on getting uh, your DNI grants funded is uh, my co-instructor is Ross Brownson, who if you don't know Ross is not only one of the founders of the field, but probably one of the most prolific, collaborative and uh, has more experience training people than anybody in the world. Uh, in DNI, and so that's that's just an uh, incredible uh, treat uh, to have him involved. He's a center at Washington University. Um, our course uh, is focused a lot on introducing you to some of the leaders in the field in different issues. If you think of different sections of putting a proposal together, that aims to convincing people the impact, the significance, to the design, to the evaluation, uh, that sort of thing. And it's done through a combination of readings um, and then uh, a lot of videos by national leaders in the field that we ask students to read, or excuse me, to look at, make notes on before the class to share their reflections. Uh, online and then the class time is spent in discussion. Sometimes that includes this national leaders, other times it's with Ross and myself. And then you have a number of assignments. I, I think probably this year there'll be four assignments which are sections of the grant. Last thing I'll say about it is that it does involve a heavy emphasis of both flipped classroom and peer uh, feedback. So it's not just Ross and me, but feedback from the others and it culminates in a mock study section review, which, uh, which uh, students really seemed to like last time. Thank you, Russ, that's wonderful. And then, um, so Tina, should we have you talk a little bit about the adaptation and context? Sure, I can talk about it a little bit. So this is a brand new course um, that Borshik and I are teaching together and we're excited to team teach again. Um, and this one is, um, it's an elective, so this is designed for people who are really un, who are interested in understanding contextual factors that are associated with how well um, an intervention or program is implemented and and potentially how effective it is as well. So answering those questions like why does something work in one hospital system but not another, or one community but not another, um, we cover a lot of concepts and frameworks methods for how to understand and assess context, including dynamic context. So if you think about COVID-19, for example, um, if you were doing some sort of work on um, vaccination right now, the multi-level context in terms of communities, policies, organizations, availability of vaccine, um, incidence of COVID-19, mortality rates, all of that is constantly shifting right now. And so trying to understand why an intervention works or doesn't work or is well implemented or not has a lot to do with context. Adaptation is the other piece of this course. And so um, David Chambers kind of famously has argued that adaptation happens whether you think it does or not with evidence-based interventions. And so accepting it and um, focusing on it and building approaches to make informed adaptations before you actually try to implement an intervention to fit the needs of the community, the stakeholder preferences that you're working with, as well as track adaptation. So the adaptations that you didn't plan, but actually are still happening. So cultural adaptations or just local adaptations, 
just bringing the science of DNI to looking at these issues of context and adaptations. And so this class has probably, I think it's four assignments where you just really um, get exposed to a lot of different models and frameworks and which ones might be most relevant to what you're working on and what you're interested in and bringing together um, context and adaptations in a in a final sort of project where you're thinking about um, where this is going to take your own research in the future. Wonderful. Thank you, Tina. We have had a, a few more questions in the chat, some uh, really meaty uh, and, and other softball. I'm going to I'm going to throw out the softball one first. So the different um, uh, t faculty members can have a have a thought about that. And the, the softball one was how many hours in general does a student take to, to work on a course on course load if they're taking one class? Um, so if they're taking the introduction to DNI class, Borsch Cantina, what have you experienced as the range of what students are usually doing? Same question for you, Bethany, and for you, Russ. I, I know uh, just to say, we have asked the instructors to put this in the um, course document, course description that's posted on our website that I'm just, can't multitask and get to exactly at this moment while we're also fielding the questions, but feel free to look on our website under each of these courses, but I'm gonna let, um, let's, let us go around the horn and answer that. And then we're gonna get to the meaty question of can you claim being a DNI expert after you finish this certificate? So I'm, I'm working through a couple of thoughts to speak to that while we answer the softball ones. So Borska. Very happy to address this. I know that we uh, came up with numbers because we needed to be specific around this, but the, the right answer is, and this is Russ Glasgow's general answer is it depends. Um, it depends on your uh, level of expertise. Uh, it depends on how much you have already read about DNI because some of the readings might be overlapping. And then also where you are at in, term, in terms of the stage of your proposal that you are working on. So for our class, we have usually, um, three to four readings per week, and you have to write reflections on them up to a page. Um, we found this very useful because students actually read the uh, readings. They have, they have incentive to read them. They get points for it. You also are working on different parts of a proposal, which um, you know, could take uh, up to you know, one to two hours if you have already had some thoughts put in there or a little bit more. You might even consult with us separately. And then the course time itself is um, one and a half hours when we meet. And so that's the time frame that you have to dedicate in a set um, hour a day to the course. So with the, all of that said, you know, again, it's the And I think Borska's internet is just uh, giving her some trouble. So like, we'll, we'll flip over here for a second and see if uh, Bethany, you have an answer on the time per course. As Borska said, it depends. And same, same thing she just said, a lot of it depends in um, our designing for dissemination course on uh, your familiarity with applying frameworks in, in particular. So we, we know that students who um, are new to DNI that are less familiar with frameworks um, that they tend to benefit from taking um, th those earlier courses so that they understand you know what do we mean by a framework how do we apply it um, this the D4D course tends to be faster um, less time consuming for them um, and so that's really the one contextual factor that I've noticed um, it makes students indicate that it takes them more or less time to, to do that course. Um, D4D is a two credit course. Um, and so we do try to make sure, do work to make sure that the time requirements are aligned with the number of credits. Thank, thank you. And I think in the interest of time, since we are getting a couple more questions um, that we'll, we'll let you look in our website at the different course descriptions and click through to the um, one pager on each course, which does give some of this additional information by course. Thank you very much for Borshik and Bethany uh, giving us that additional input. Um, I've put an answer in the chat to one of the other questions we received. So I'm gonna let people refer to it there on, is this program designed to build capacity for both DNI research and practice? And it's one we've definitely thought a lot about, you know, are we trying to help people be better implementers or are we building implementation science? And 
we, we think we're doing both, but we definitely have a bit of a stronger emphasis on building the science and developing the research methods. We think that's important for implementers too, um, you know, to really understand how to do these things. It gets into how to implement. But I want to not skirt the question on, will you be a DNI expert when you finish this program? And we all know the answer to that is going to be a bit of it depends, just like we heard for how much time it takes on the coursework. How much of a background and a grounding in DNI science did you already have when you came to us? Uh, we're tailoring to where everyone's at and bringing everyone along, seeing improvements in competencies. But if you were pretty green in uh, the area of implementation science when you joined us, then you may not yet feel you're a full-fledged expert when you're finished. Everyone will have developed expertise, though, in, in the science. I wanted to give, I, I think that the other key things that need to happen is you need to have done some of it, been on grants, led some grants, been a co-I on grants for uh, the DNI science methods piece um, to really bring that up to the full, like, highest level of expert. I'd love to hear others' thoughts on it, but I am going to just give one specific example. So Margot Harrison, who um, just is completing our DNI certificate now, she... Um, she did TIDR, T-I-D-R-H, before she joined us and then went through our program, felt like we provided significant additional training. And she just published a, a single authored, she's the only author, on this DNI Science Methods article in the Journal of General Internal Medicine um, just last week. And we've posted it on our DNI website uh, for Accords because we're so proud of her. So that just gives the, the sense that, you know, when people are finished, they can write a an article all on their own that's published in a major journal about implementation science, they're uh, ready to do uh, DNI work in the field. Does someone else want to answer this really hard question? I was uh, tried to give a, uh, a little bit of uh, ingest, but a strong no uh, to it uh, for the reasons that you said, Amy, in the same way that I don't think like, let's say getting a PhD or a doctorate makes you, you know, an expert or like a leader in the field. It gives you, this program gives you competencies in, in the way that we've focused a lot on doing that. But again, I would say in order to claim an expert, if you want to focus on the science things, I would look for somebody that has multiple grants, has been successful, that has a series of an ongoing research program, that has a strong publication record. Um, I don't know there's any magic thing when you get to be an expert, if you know, that's just you get really old and opinionated or uh, what, but um, I think that uh, you do need more than that, but I think this would certificate gives you a really firm foundation. Uh, to then uh, employ that and you know achieve some of those other things. Uh, more complex, and I know we're out of time discussion of what makes you a leader and kind of the more applied function or in terms of, you know, leading big, major, successful, multiple programs and things. That's great, Russ. And I just, Tina, could you just briefly speak to what you put in the chat as well? I think that's a helpful additional third perspective for people to hear. Yeah, I would say that um, from reviewing a lot of grants, especially hybrid type projects that are bringing implementation science and effectiveness research together, one of the most common critiques that um, you see in study section is that you're missing an implementation science person. And that's because, you know, all the COIs might be, or the PI and the COIs might all be interested in this topic, but nobody's had any training or necessarily worked on any applications um, as a DNI scientist. And so with the certificate, I think this actually helps build your bio sketch to kind of make that argument to reviewers that you have a really solid foundation. Um, and then helps you get started, you know, building up towards your very old person expertise many, many grants later, where you have um, been the PI or co-I on so many projects that you are clearly an expert. So you have to start somewhere. And I think that this is a really good way to kind of get a little evidence on your bio sketch for what you know and what you can do. Fantastic. Okay, well, we are up to top of the hour, everyone. So we have recorded this webinar and the slides and the webinar will be available on our website. Elise has put our website in the chat a few moments ago. Um, we're also going to be emailing out those who had registered to attend the webinar with the website uh, materials and information. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you to our faculty for helping us answer these uh, tough questions. Thank you for asking the tough questions that make us think on these things. And uh, everyone enjoy the rest of your week.